Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Stagno, and I'm currently working um, as a vulnerability researcher and exploit developer for Exodus Intelligence. So my day-to-day -day job is uh, uh, basically starring at IDA while trying to understand if the component I'm auditing is vulnerable and uh, how I can exploit it. And my focus is on the Windows OS platform, both from kernel and user land, as well as third-party components. So I previously worked as a penetration tester and red teamer before transitioning into a full-oriented research role. So uh, please bacon your seat belts because today we only have like 40 minutes and the aim of this talk is uh, bringing you from basically little or no knowledge at all uh, about this topic to what I can say uh, a good level. So um, we will see like um, the protected process and protected process light uh, implementation, uh, their security model, mitigation, past attack, uh, attacks, uh, as well as some novel attacks that uh, allowed me to um, uh, basically disable antivirus or EDR. And um, with that said, uh, before uh, I, can sp I, I can tell you that there are like three, maybe four main areas of research that can benefit from uh, looking into protected process or protected process light. And the first area is penetration test or red team because, um, uh, for example, LSAS, as we can see later, uh, can be protected by PPL technology. And of course, as a red teamer, we want to dump uh, credential outside LSAS. So um, we should try to understand how we can bypass the protected process light technology. And um, we can also try to understand if the protection can be applied to our own implant in order to prevent the antivirus to detect or at least kill our implant. And um, the second area is reverse engineering because protected processes are also used to basically shield uh, DRM protected contents. So we can try to investigate um, the main target and dump DRM protected content out of it. And the third area is of course vulnerability research because if we can instrument and debug protected process, uh, we can also try to FATS, triage crashes, and with the end goal of uh, finding vulnerabilities in it. And fourth and last area is of course Dwitzel. And the more Dwitzel and his team make Windows secure, the more we can brag about uh, when finding a vulnerability or a bypass um, in their mitigation. And on a funny side note, Microsoft doesn't really care and doesn't really consider PPL as a security boundary, so finding a vulnerability in it uh, will grant us no, ba no bug bounty, but uh, forever glory from our fellow red teamers. So before diving into the uh, protected process uh, model, we should familiarize a bit more uh, with the Windows security model. And in Windows, basically any users with uh, the C debug privilege can uh, um, basically access uh, any other process on the machine running on the machine. Um, this is regarding of their security um, token. And uh, for this reason, they can uh, read and write process memory or inject code. And this functionality is done for tools like uh, Process Explorer or Task Manager in order to provide information back to the user. So given the precedent bit of information, why do you think that Microsoft introduced protected process uh, in the first place? And if your answer was uh, for security concerns, well, then think again, because the debug privileges, logical behavior, basically clash with against um, the DRM um, requirements that are imposed by the multimedia industry. So protected process was born uh, to prevent users to access uh, protected digital contents. So pro protected process can be created uh, only if the executable image is signed and it must be signed by a special Windows Media Certificate. 
and an example of protected processes that are running on your own PC. There are, for example, the audio device process that basically uh, hosts DRM protected content and decrypt the content on the flight as well as like the system process. And system process uh, must be protected in the eye of Microsoft because uh, um, it basically store, again, um, decryption information that is generated by the kernel security provider and um, all like the security and the kernel handles are stored as well in the system process. So at the kernel level, uh, the protected process is uh, basically supported in two folds. The first one is the entire bulk of uh, process creation is basically of course in kernel mode only in order to prevent any injection attacks. And the second thing is protected process is implemented in kernel specifically in a, a structure that is called e-process. And this e-process structure basically modify the behavior of the process manager. So when you try to request access to a protected process, uh, certain access will be denied. And this again is to prevent injection or pretty much any other modification to a protected process. So since protected process again uh, exist alongside normal Windows processes, um, they just add more constraints to their process. And the only access right that are granted for protected process are the one that I've listed on the slide. Uh, so for example, you cannot call the process VM read access right because that will allow you to basically tamper or interact with a protected process and this is not, al not allowed. So um, there is only one exception and there are for the process terminate and process, uh, sorry, and the thread suspend resume and these two different as access rights are uh, only enforced uh, on protected process light anti-malware technology or a different type of signer that we will see later on. So all executable code running and loaded inside a protected process must be signed by Microsoft or if it's an audio codec, it must be signed with a special DRM certificate, again obtained from Microsoft. And with that, Microsoft basically obtain the, maintain the control on which process, process can be protected process and um, basically enforce this type of protection. And there is, uh, an opportunity for the kernel and basically to provide an interface to query the status of the kernel itself and basically the kernel report back uh, the cleanliness of uh, the kernel and the protected content is only unlocked if no unsigned code is found running on the kernel. And this interface is part of Microsoft and only Microsoft can use the type of interface that is not really documented and is part of the protected environment authorization framework. So when thinking about a uh, protected process, then uh, basically security boundary that Microsoft want to enforce is sandboxing processes from user mode access. So if you have like administrator level access on, on the machine, you can load your own uh, drivers as we can see, as we've seen um, this morning in the Omri talk and we can basically load own, own driver and bypass this type of protection because a driver can load code and code on, running on, on kernel side can patch out the e-process structure that I will show you. So drivers that has uh, the protection uh, flag patched out um, will be basically in open violation of Microsoft uh, protected media path and eventually they will be blocked from loading. But uh, according to Microsoft documentation, uh, kernel patch protection and the protected environment can all uh, detect and automatically report such attempts. Um, but unfortunately, when directly confronting Microsoft about this topic, because kernel patch protection guard does not do that, doesn't prevent you to patch out the e-process structure and remove the protection from a process, Microsoft basically replied that this type of uh, uh, detection is not baked on by kernel detection and it's only uh, a manual uh, list that Microsoft have to enforce. So it's just the old and boring uh, driver signature block list. 
So let's move in another topic uh, that may not seem so relevant in the context of protected process, but please bear with me for a second. So in Windows, uh, LSAS is uh, the keystone of Windows authentication system. And it is responsible for the user authentication, uh, enforcing security policy, as well as handling uh, password changes and so on. So uh, there is, doesn't come as a surpri surprise that um, attackers want to dump um, cached password in LSAS process. And this is one of the most common um, techniques, tactics, and procedure we, we are seeing in today's landscape is um, for an attacker to land a shell on a machine, um, up, upgrade its privilege to a local admin, and then run Mimikatz to dump credentials out of, um, of, out of uh, LSAS process. So you might wonder, does Windows really allow that? I mean, LSAS is a critical process, so why one user, even if an admin user, should be able to dump password outside it? Because if we investigate LSAS process, we can see like in the blue box that LSAS is running as the highest uh, privileged users on Windows, that is the NT authority system, and that for administrator users, uh, LSAS basically grant no permission, no access right at all. So how that is possible? I mean, we don't have any access right, but we can still dump credential outside of LSAS. Anyone want to take a guess? Why is that happening? <laughs> yeah, it is happening because um, administrator users has the C-debug privilege enabled by default and cdebug privilege uh, can allow you to basically access any other running process no matter of the security descriptor that it has. So in this case, even if LSAS doesn't grant you any access right, an administrator user has the cdebug privileges that basically disregard the LSAS access. All right, so let's shed some light in protected process lightweight cousins. So, since Vista, basically, um, the entire concept of protected process has been extended. And uh, if protected process were originally created to protect DRM uh, content, uh, Microsoft also find out that the entire concept uh, can be applied to protect critical processes. So for example, LSAS, again, or the Windows Defender. And uh, so nowadays there are two types of protected process, the protected process and protected process light. And um, Microsoft, uh, with the advent of protected process light, intro also introduced a concept of signer. And um, the signer is basically a bit of information that is coming from um, a, digital, a digital signature that is uh, used to sign the executable. So Microsoft, with protected process light, still maintains the control on which process can run as pro PPL because they still have to sign your own executable. So as it was for protected process, uh, PPL uh, imp implementation rely on uh, kernel flags, uh, specifically uh, a structure that is present in e-process. It's um, three member structures, three bytes in total, and it has different fields. Some of those are listed, all of them are listed on the slide. It's a signature level, section signature level, and protection. So let's dive a bit more into the meaning of this field. So instead of simply being on or off, and there are three types, uh, different types of level. Uh, there are like seven levels listed so far, and the highest of which are the Win TCB signer or Win system. And um, Win system is basically the highest priority signer, and it is used for the system process, pretty much system process only. After that, there is the Win TCB, that is the trusted computer based uh, signer, and so forth. So there is missing like three more levels uh, level two, that is used for .NET native code generation, and two more system levels that are, um, are not documented nor um, used at the moment. It's level eight and nine. Level eight is called uh, app, and level nine is called max. But what happens if we basically graphically display 
all those levels. So if we represent the protection levels, we can see that system is actually the most privileged one. Uh, while for example, there is this uh, weird case of Windows and app signer that sits at the same level and for which honestly I don't know why Microsoft had decided this design choice. So again, if we look at LSAS in like all the normal build that we have on our PC, we can see that in the red box, LSAS has the PPL um, protection verification enabled in the extended key usage. So with, with that, pretty much there is a, a security order that the kernel enforce when dealing with protected process or protected process light. And the order is the following one. So protected process always win over protected process light. And the protected process can gain access to a protected process or PPL processes uh, only if this, their signer is greater of or equal of the targets. Protected process light can never obtain any access to a protected process and the protected process light can access only protected process light processes <laughs> only if their signer is greater of equal. So this is uh, schematics or what happened when the open API, uh, open process API is called against one of the PP or PPL process. And uh, basically it's more complex th than this because uh, for example if the colors protection is below target protection of course the access denied is returned while, while if um, the colors protection is greater or equal but um, uh, the ACL of the target does not allow the colors to access it again the access denied is returned. The only exception to this is uh, if the target has the C debug privileges that we seen before then well, the access is granted. And uh, only if the color protection is greater or equal to the target, then access is granted again. All right, so what are the main constraints when dealing with uh, PP or PPL? So the main constraint is, uh, are that basically uh, PPL processes can only load signed DLLs. So with signed DLLs, it means that if the process has a Windows signer, uh, it can only load Windows signed DLLs and or higher level, not anything lower. So guess who can run as PPL protected but does not that by default? Yeah, LSAS. LSAS has uh, its own level, so it can run as, LSA, uh, al, as PPL protected, but it does not by default. And why does not that by default? Because Microsoft have to maintain uh, third party compatibilities for, um, w from older modules that basically implement authentication that is different from like the Windows Hello, so biometric authentication or access token. And these kind of components basically load their own DLLs directly into LSAS process. That is an horrible thing to do because LSAS is not really documented nor it exposes any API. So you should stop using such components. But Microsoft also uh, agreed that this type of uh, components should be eliminated and in um, June or July 2022, basically in the latest uh, uh, insider preview, preview builds, um, has turned on the PPL protection by default on LSAS. So brace yourself because this type of mitigation is coming and no easy way dumping credential out of LSAS protected process. So speaking about uh, PP or PPL, of course we have services. And services, uh, again, are managed by the service control manager. Service control manager basically um, manage the entire process service creation and um, have different kind of, of, of control on the, service, on the services itself. So when the service control manager basically read the configuration of each service, it read it from um, the registry key and the type and different values that the register key can have is the one that I've listed on the slide. So there is uh, one caveat to that because then 
uh, service control manager run as WinTCB, it is the second last, the second most privileged uh, signer. So it can basically dominate the, all the other processes apart from the system process. And um, with that said, any users that can get uh, to the service control manager um, level or still its level, it can basically, it should be able to access all the other protected process, processes. Um, but Microsoft, uh, again, it's aware of that. So basically, the service control manager also guard the following API in order to prevent uh, uh, modification to any other ser protected services running on Windows. So PPL is a type of protection um, that is applied to user mode process by the kernel. So if you can gain uh, kernel code level access, uh, you can again try to patch out all these, in, all these flags. And to do, that, to do so, you just need to basically zeroing out the e-process structure, the signature level, and signal, a section signature level, and protection of a process. If you can do so, basically the entire application loses uh, its protected status, but it loses that in a transparent way. So um, it doesn't really cause like a blue screen of that, nor it trips the kernel patch protection. So since the uh, e-process structures change and vary between every major build of Windows, I've listed a link where you can gather uh, a list of offsets for this structure. And one of the possible bypass you can, you can do, instead of writing your own driver, is to use Mimikatz one. And um, Mimikas basically allow you with the following commands to um, uh, upgrade or remove a, pro a protection from a process. The only quirk is that uh, Mimikas doesn't restore the uh, protection level, the original protection level of a process. So if you are interested in uh, doing so during an attack, instead of uh, uh, lowering, for example, LSAS protection, you should upgrade uh, Mimikas one after that dumping, dumping the credential and so on. So the main difference between protected process and protected process light is that um, basically protected process ignores known DLLs. And uh, known DLLs is uh, a mechanism that uh, the, um, basically allow the Windows OS to cache uh, commonly used system DLLs. So it is a performance mechanism that uh, with the time it also began um, uh, a security mechanism because basically it prevents you to drop a trojanized version of a system DLL into the system folder and basically replace them and have your high level services or processes running with the injection. Um, so protected process always load DLLs from the disk. They completely disregard uh, known DLLs. While for protected process light, the normal behavior will apply. So let's explore the early launch anti-malware ecosystem that was built upon the PPL technology. So when dealing with antivirus uh, and EDR, most of them nowadays run uh, with the PPL ELAM technology. And this type of technology basically consists in three main components. The first one that is a kernel driver that the antivirus basically use to intercept input output uh, requests to the file system and implement blocking capabilities. The second component is the user mode service that basically shield the entire uh, antivirus or at least manage some of its components. And the third component is the user mode UI that basically shows information back to the user. So running as PPL, uh, no code injection is possible and um, no termination is possible because this is ELAM um, signer level, so process termination and process suspension should not be possible. All right. So. What does ELAM do? Basically, ELAM report back a series of information uh, that I've listed on the slide back to the main uh, OS. So ELAM drivers basically loads, uh, are the first one that loads before any other drivers on Windows, 
and basically monitors other drivers' initialization routines in order to try to understand if they are like deemed malicious. And um, they must register a callback in order to communicate back and forth with Windows. And the only thing is ELAM drivers are limited to this type of information because since they load before any other driver, they don't have file system access unless they implement their own file system driver. For the same reason, they cannot uh, gather like network intelligence or stuff because the network driver is not loaded yet. So the resulting uh, classification can be one of the following. And Windows basically allow a driver to load based on the group policy uh, setting that is set for that ma specific machine or domain. So where the ELAM driver store its signature? Because the only match that it can do is basically a signature match against known malicious drivers. And the signature database is stored under the ELAM hive. Uh, the Windows path is written on the slide. And the only advantage of uh, um, antivirus vendors to comply with that path is because that path and the respective uh, register key are guarded by the OS. So um, uh, the antivirus vendor should only care about implementing integrity check on their own component, but not on this type of pets and I. So there are any bypass for this type of driver? Well, mm, there are kind of two. So the first one is you can load your own driver at a very late stage uh, when the ELAM driver at that point is unloaded. So you can argue that at this point the rootkit is not enabled yet and it can be caught by um, a kernel scanner. But pretty much no vendor do that because implementing uh, a detection scanner in kernel mode require high privileges and scanners tend to run with low privileges for security concern. And the second area is boot kits, but that's a completely another research area and I won't speak about that today. So how we can debug and reverse engineering protected processes? The first thing is um, if you can test under Windows 7, just do it because protected processes uh, um, are implemented uh, since Windows Vista, but protected process light and the ELAM features are only enabled since Windows 8. Or since you cannot really debug a protected process, you should switch to a kernel mode debugger. And to do so, I've listed a couple of, uh, of commands that you can get back from the slide once I publish them. So there is just a bit of experience here because Windows um, doesn't really work well when debugging services. And the reason is why services is running with um, high privileged users and in session zero. And session zero is basically a segregated desktop se session that doesn't allow uh, Windows spawning or user interaction. So I'm sharing some one-liners where you can set up Windows service debugging. All right, so let me skip some slides because I, they are mostly commands. All right, so sometimes you cannot really disable all the components of the antivirus with that way. So the only things left are basically force the antivirus to unload the drivers and you can do that by basically renaming the drivers on the file system by mounting the file system under Linux uh, as well as removing the light malware protection flag from the registry. Again, as a reference, I've listed all my commands. So let me, let me tell you about this interesting case. So Kaspersky basically uh, supports the ELAM technology and PPL technology from Microsoft because it's used it uh, in a proper way to shield the antivirus processes uh, from malware. So malware cannot terminate Kaspersky because it's employed PPL technology. But the developer were nice enough to include a flag, a flag from the command line that you can use to disable this type of shield. And um, the protected process uh, then lose transparently again uh, their protection status and then the malware can do whatever they like. So what this teaches us? 
uh, it basically say that uh, if we can work smart and not hard, we should always uh, aim for the low hanging fruit before because every time that you save with that way, uh, you can spend later on researching for, for uh, the attack surface or other and more vulnerabilities. So Windows Defender is another completely different beast, but if you are interested into looking into Windows Defender, uh, you must know that basically Microsoft doesn't really want us to look into Defender. So they have this uh, um, callback operation that basically uh, cripple the access mask of the Wind Defender process. So they cannot really stop us, again, if we are in kernel, if, if we have kernel mode access, then you just need to patch out this operation callback. Then you are kind of free to explore the Wind Defender process. But let's jump into the juicy part. Let's eat towards some past research and some novel attacks. So when researching a new attack surface, I always look uh, at the work of fellow researcher because uh, that's helped me to better understand uh, the attack surface, the component that I'm auditing, uh, and um, the component's complexity. So I cannot mention um, Ionescu's 2014 research. He basically thought, um, since the Windows error reporting uh, must gather a crash dump from a protected process, it should also run as a protected process. So what happened if I able to crash a protected process, uh, will, be, will I be able to read any crash dump from it? And um, back at the time, the where fault secure process uh, had um, basically brought out the dump of the process in these two steps. First, he write the dump, and then he encrypt the dump. So perhaps you can spot the vulnerability. You can race against the full secure service and steal the dump before it gets encrypted. So unfortunately, this flow was fixed in 2015, and you cannot use this technique anymore because now the, win, uh, the word full secure basically encrypts the dump on the fly before writing it on the system. And in 2018, James Forshaw from Google Project Zero uh, found another bypass. So at high level concept, um, this uh, exploit is a cache poisoning attack where an attacker basically uh, can add its own DLL to the known DLL's cache. And um, to do so, basically it tricks um, a WinTCB process into writing an entry in the known DLL section for the attackers. And um, doing so, basically, it's an admin to PPL bypass. And this type of attacks is confirmed to work uh, on the latest Windows version because Microsoft in, um, has indicated multiple times that is not intended to service this type of vulnerabilities. But in July 2022, they again changed some, um, some mechanism on which the known DLL basically works and it doesn't work anymore. That perhaps uh, uh, is a good sign because it's a step forward in Windows security and an opportunity for us to uh, dive into another vulnerability. So speaking of which, if you remember, one of the first uh, PP, PPL constraint uh, we saw today, it was that uh, any process cannot be terminated. So the suspension should be possible. And uh, with that in mind, I try to um, think of uh, uh, the following steps for a malware to do. So the first step can be like for a malware to get executed, of course, on the machine. And the first step is pretty easy because our malware doesn't really need to implement a lot of functionalities to work, so the detection will be pretty much zero. At that point, the malware can uh, spawn a suspended thread and after the suspended thread, the malware can suspend the antivirus process because PP only prevent process termination, so suspension is, is still possible, right? And uh, then when the antivirus process is suspended, well, we can do harmful thing and then restore, restore everything back and safely die. So 
Turned out this technique wasn't very successful, as most of the antivirus nowadays employ the ELAM technique, that is a PPL, and under PPL, suspension attacks are not possible. So if you are wondering what is the uh, orange asterisk, the orange asterisk are for antivirus that uh, doesn't really prevent uh, process suspension, but basically frees any other process creation while their, um, their main process is suspended. So if you have something that is running, it's continue to run, but um, other than that, you are not allowed to spawn any other process. And then another attack vector uh, I was able to think of. So basically it was abusing the application verifier mechanism. And the application verifier basically is an interesting mechanism on Windows because it allows you to load a DLL in uh, an application that you are testing. And it is for testing purpose. So the application verifier basically allow you to load a DLL and this DLL will be loaded into any other process and you should specify the name of the process in the proper registry key, then this DLL is loaded even before kernel 32. So what happened? Well, it happened that uh, when PPL is enabled, your DLL that is loaded into a PP or PPL process must be signed. Otherwise, Microsoft really complain, specifically code integrity complain, and um, the DLL is not allowed to run. So doing so basically has the opposite effect of protecting your service because code integrity won't allow the DLL to load and basically kill this, uh, the process or the service that was trying to load the DLL, causing uh, denial of service attacks on the antivirus. So we can see, hope you can see that too, um, that for example on Avira antivirus, uh, Avira is running as an uh, uh, anti-malware signed process and if I try to use the application verifier attack that I've just outlined before, basically code integrity complains that the, that the DLL that I'm trying to load is not signed and since, and since uh, not signed DLL doesn't mesh with the anti-malware protection level, it killed the service. And killing this type of service basically left out the machine completely exposed from all the other malware that can freely kill the remaining antivirus process and go on. So what happened when I test this type of attacks against the usual antivirus? Well, it was much way better than the previous one. And um, basically for uh, all the orange marks antivirus, and these are products that only allow some subset of their process to be killed that way. Why, of course, the uh, red one asterisk are for um, antivirus that doesn't really employ PPL technique. That honestly for an antivirus is pretty shame. I mean, you should rely on OS protection instead of implementing your own and re reinventing the wheel. So following my responsible disclosure, this type of attack doesn't really work anymore, but it's uh, always good to double check that because bugs can be reintroduced. All right, we did it. So before having your, our Q&A session, um, as a side note, I just want you to remember that the slide that deck that I will publish be after that, um, it will be like more verbose and include like a lot of references and commands. So if you really are into PPL technology or just want a nice refresher, you should grab the slides. Other than that, thank you. I had a question about the uh, the DRM that you were talking about. I was just curious Sorry? the the DRM you were talking about where you're required to get that uh, sort of sign off from Microsoft to have like a the, the the license attached to your your audio or music or video file. How how difficult is it to get a license from Microsoft? Like what sort of checks do you uh, like is it as trivial as getting a TLS cert or uh, I think that you have to be like a huge vendor that uh, its main focus is like media content and you basically request the signing certificate from Microsoft, they will give it out and no problem at all after than that. So um, it only work with like uh, huge publishers. Got it, got it. Not really if you are like a small studios or. Got it, thank you. 
let's thanks again Paolo